Happy Thursday, Energy Express. It's me, your friend Joel, and welcome back for another fun day. Pack your backpack. We're going to WVU. You future Mountaineers are going to get to meet my friend Maddie, and she's going to show us around campus. Take it away, Maddie. Hi there, future Mountaineers. My name is Maddie, and I am a senior marketing major here from the central part of the state in Colton, West Virginia. And I'm gonna be showing you guys around today. Our first stop on our tour is actually here in Woodburn Circle. So this is our historic center of our downtown area of campus, really made up of three main buildings. The first building I wanna point out is actually over on your left. That is Martin Hall, and that is home to the Reed College of Media. So majors in there are like journalism and PR. Now I'm gonna have you all pan back towards the center. This is Woodburn Hall. This is like the star of the show within a Woodburn Circle, and it's home to the Eberly College of Arts and Sciences. So majors such as political science and international studies are back in that building. And the far end of the circle, you're gonna see Chitwood Hall. That is home to world language and linguistics. And we have over 12 different languages that you can study while you're here at WVU. But follow us along for the tour and you're gonna learn a lot more about West Virginia University. Welcome to our Mountaineer statue. So here at WVU, we are the Mountaineer. And this is way more than just a mascot to us. It really represents the fierce and pioneer nature of not only WVU, but the state of West Virginia. The state motto for the state of West Virginia is that Mountaineers are always free. So we're not just Mountaineers up here in Morgantown. The whole state is Mountaineers. And that's something that we're so proud of. And we always are trying to give back to the state, whether it's through service, education, or research, we are passionate to helping all Mountaineers in the state of West Virginia. Welcome to the Mountain Lair. So this is what we would refer to as a student union, which basically means that it's like the living room of the university. This is where students come, hang out, relax, grab a bite to eat, go to important offices, and they also have a lot of fun too. So as far as the offices that are located here in the Mountain Lair, you're gonna see that we have our IT services office, our career services office, which helps with getting you a job after you graduate, and also our clubs and organizations office. We have over 500 different clubs that you can join here at WVU, ranging all the way from, I'm in the sales club for my major, um, but then there's also clubs that for sports clubs, so I was in the fencing club for a hot second because I love the parent trap, and then even all the way to the Red Lobster Cheddar Bay Biscuit Association. So there's really a club for just about any interest that you might have. Um, other than that, we have a lot of food here in the mountain layer. So we have two really different types of eateries. We're first off gonna have um, cafeteria style eateries. So these are gonna be places where you can eat as much as you want and stay as much as you want. And then everything that you see around me is a more quick service type of eatery. So there's actually a brand new Panda Express we just put in here. And also my personal favorite, Chick-fil-A is also here as well. So we love our mountain layer here for all the food options, but we also love it for fun. Um, right beside us is actually the entertainment and arts and entertainment box office. So from there, we can actually get some really discounted tickets on shows that come. So actually my sophomore year, the Migos were in town. Tickets for the general public were like $85, but because I was a WVU student, I could get tickets for $20. So anytime anything like that happens in the Morgantown area, the arts and entertainment box office always has your back. Also right below us, we have a huge billiards room where students could have like pool tournaments and stuff like that, really fun. But sort of the main event that goes on here at the Mountain Lair has to be up all night. This is every Friday and Saturday from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. We have lots of fun going on here. Right beside us is actually where they put huge buffets of free food. Those are gonna be your two favorite words as a college student. They're gonna have biscuits and gravy in the morning. They're going to have tacos, hamburgers, hot dogs, delicious food. Um, but then they're also gonna have events to pair with it. So when I've been here, they've had Build-A-Bear workshop. They have had indoor ice skating. They've had laser tag. My freshman year, my first week here, I rode a mechanical pig right behind us. So really the opportunities are limitless here in the mountain lair and lots of awesome resources that you have to take advantage of while you're here. Welcome to the mountain lair green. So this space is really utilized as a place for students to hang out between, before, 
and after classes. So we have the tables and we also have that big piece of green AstroTurf over there. So while school is in session, you'll normally see students hanging out, um, eating Chick-fil-A on a picnic blanket, or sometimes even bringing their dogs to play. So a really fun spot here. But also while we're standing here, we can see four different residence halls here located on our downtown area of campus. As far as residence life here goes at WVU, you can actually pick your very own building, floor, room, and bed that you'll be sleeping in while you're here at WVU. And honestly, that's one of my favorite things about the housing process because I didn't have to worry about knowing where I was gonna live. I got to pick exactly where I wanted. And we do have four different styles of living. So those are really um, able for you to be able to personalize your first year here and really pick the, re the uh, freshman residence hall that's really gonna suit your needs the most. Now, while we're standing here, again, we can see four different residence halls. And I do wanna go ahead and point those out for you. Right behind us, the brick building with the wide around the windows is gonna be Stoniker Hall. Stoniker Hall is sweet style of living. Behind that is gonna be Dadisman Hall. You can't really see it, but runs exactly parallel to Stoniker Hall. So I swear it's back there. And then as we go across the little plaza here, you're gonna see the brick building with the green in between the windows is gonna be Borman Hall North. Borman Hall North is community style and it is reserved for just our ladies. It's our only single sex residence hall here at WVU. And just a little bit below the hill from there, the brick building with the white around the windows is gonna be Borman Hall South. Borman Hall South is sweet style of living and has my personal favorite dining hall in it, the Borman Bistro. So this is really pretty much it with the Mountain Lair Green, a really fun place for students to hang out and relax. Hey PBS, welcome to my crib. Actually, this is Oakland Hall. This is one of our many residence halls that we do have here at WBU. And this is the model room. Now I want you to take a look around the room and I know that many of our residence halls are very unique from one another, but you're gonna find that there are a few things that are standard. The first is gonna be the square footage. Now this room is a little bit one of our longer rooms, so it's more rectangular shape, but you're gonna find that sometimes we also have more square shaped rooms, but no matter what shape the room is, the square footage is gonna be pretty standard amongst all of them. Other things that are gonna be standard is gonna be the furniture. Of course, I'm on the twin XL bed that all of our residence halls have. Also, all of our residence halls will have dressers, desk with a desk chair, and also a few of them will also have nightstands as well. So those are some things that you can expect to have as a freshman to start off with. But then you can really, you know, be creative and bring a lot of things from home to decorate your room with. And I really think that that personal touch in your room really makes it feel a lot more homey and makes your residence hall room something that you can get really excited to come back to after a long day of class. One of my personal favorite ways that I decorated my residence hall room my freshman year is going to be hanging up a lot of pictures. I found that it really helped with my homesickness, missing mom and dad, and really made me laugh and think about a lot of memories from before. And then when I would make new memories with my friends in my freshman year, I put those up on the wall as well. And so now I have a huge collection of photos that I'm going to put in an album one day so I can look back on my time here at WVU. We are now outside of Oakland Hall, but this is actually where we're gonna wrap up our tour today. Thank you all so much for joining us and letting us take you around the place that we call home. But we do hope that sometime in the near future that our country roads lead you home to here at WVU. As always, let's go Mountaineers and have a beautiful day. And now we head over to someone who is going to take my job from me in a few years. We go to Florence Influencer in the Making, Abby, who walks us through a seed bomb activity. Hello, my name is Abby. I am the 10 year old CEO and founder of the Photosynthesizing Farmer, where we specialize and grow together garden boxes. They're gardening kits made just for kids. I'm so happy you're here. Today, we're going to talk about pollinators, what they are, and how we can all do our part to help them. First, let's talk a little bit about pollinators. Did you know that we have a lot of native pollinators in our state of West Virginia? You've probably seen them. They are birds, bees, bats, beetles, butterflies, flies, and even wasps. Pollinators have a very important job to do. These amazing creatures move pollen from one flower to another so that plants can produce fruits and seeds. 
This is important for growing food. That is why we need to help pollinators. We will be making seed bombs. This is a very fun way to grow flowers for the pollinators. You will need tissue paper, wildflower seeds, water, and a bowl. Keep in mind, one piece of tissue paper makes one seed bomb. Step one, tear your tissue paper into small pieces. I have found that quarter size pieces work best. Your tissue paper may come like this, already folded. If it comes like this, go ahead and just fold it. Then, this will make tearing e much easier and faster. Like so. Once the paper has been torn, place it in a bowl if you haven't yet. I have already done this. Step three, pour some water over your tissue paper. The water should cover the paper. Be sure to use your fingers to move the paper around so as to make sure it's completely soaked. Now just use your fingers to spread it around. Make sure it's completely soaked. Step four, gather up the wet paper and give it a nice squeeze. You wanna wring out most of the water. You should be able to form your paper into a ball. If your, ball, if your paper is still dripping wet, you may need to squeeze it a bit more. If it won't stick together at all, you may need to wet it a bit more. Step five. Use your thumbs to make a crater in, in your ball. Now it'll look kind of like a bird's nest. Next, get a big pinch of your wildflower seeds. As you can see, I poured mine out into a bowl, so it'd be easier to get a big pinch of. Now we're gonna put the seeds in, in the crater, and now we're gonna close it up. Just gonna squeeze it closed. Here's my seed bomb. Now we need to set it aside to dry for 24 hours. Now hold up, a whole day may seem like a long time, but your seed bomb needs to dry before you can do anything with it. Once your seed bomb is dried, I recommend throwing it in your backyard. Make sure to throw it in a sunny place that doesn't have too much plants, tall plants that might shade your seed bomb from the sun. Make sure to give it lots of water. Thank you for joining me. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram. For more gardening activities and fun facts at, at Abby the Photo Farmer. And remember, we are always growing together. Bye! Okay friends, don't look down. Next up, we're gonna head into the canopy with Adventure West Virginia for some zip lining fun. Let's go see what zip lining is all about. Hi, I'm Garrett Weigel. And I'm Alex Doyle. And we're both graduate assistants with Adventure West Virginia. And so today we're here at our outdoor education center to be able to talk a little bit about what we do. And so to start off for that, I want to start a little bit broad. And so what that means is talking about what Adventure West Virginia is in general. And so we're actually a program through West Virginia University that does a series of different trips and programming for faculty, staff, students, as well as the general public. And so what the bulk of that means is that we do a wider range from just a couple hour, a half day kind of programs and trips, all the way up to multi-week trips that can be outside of the country. And so within there, we do a wide variety of outdoor recreational activities, such as rock climbing, whitewater rafting, 
zip lining, high roof activities, or even just your occasional hike around the Morgantown area or even the state as a whole. And so what we're going to do specifically today is talk a little bit about where we are and what we do up here. So, you're probably wondering where we are right now. We're actually at the Outdoor Education Center in West Virginia University's Research Forest. That's just north of Cooper's Rock State Park and about 20 minutes up the road from Morgantown. And so what that means for us, specifically at the Outdoor Education Center, is that we do customized programming for a variety of different groups that focus on personal and group development. How we do that is that we are able to kind of set up a series of different portable initiatives, low ropes courses, high ropes course elements, or zipline canopy tour programming. And so what that means for us is that we deal with a lot of different types of groups and participants. These programs are open to the public and we normally operate March to November. Usually in a season we have about 6,000 participants go through our programs. Awesome. And so why don't we go ahead and head up to the course now and we will show you kind of behind the scenes a little bit of what it takes for us to go out on our zipline canopy tour course today. All right. So now that we're up here at our course, what we have to do next is go through a series of different discussions as well as a couple different skills to be able to show for our participants what they need to do to be out on course. Starting with that is that we have our course manager actually talk through an orientation process for them so that way they understand exactly what everything is going to be a part of and what that means for them. So today we'll be going on our canopy tour zipline course. Our course consists of four zip lines ranging from, ranging from 200 feet to 1,000 feet in length. You'll be going at speeds of 32 miles per hour and at heights of 50 feet. Throughout the course, we also have a suspended bridge, a ladder, a rappel at the end, followed by a brief hike. Alrighty friends, so this right here is our ground school. And so what it represents is actually our lines out on the course. And so what we're going to do here is actually show you and have you go through these skills so that you understand kind of what you need to do from a participant lens and what we're going to be doing from a guide role. And so what that means first is that while we are out on course, we want you to enjoy the ride. And so what that means for us is that the guides are taking care of all the transfers. They're doing all the clipping, all the technical stuff with your trolleys. All we're going to have you do is essentially hold on to the handlebars and do as asked by the guides. Now at any point in time, if you feel like your harnesses kind of feel weird, they're getting a little bit of a pull, if you feel like something doesn't feel right with your gear, please get myself or Alex and we can be able to work with you to make sure that everything is okay. And so what's gonna happen here is that I'm gonna clip myself in and kind of walk us through those skills. And so what's gonna happen next so now that I've clipped in, I'd go through a little bit of a check with you, make sure everything is looking okay. And once I get the go-ahead from Alex, what I'm going to end up doing is asking you to sit down right into your harness, put both hands on the handlebars. And then when we're ready, I'm going to end up unhooking from this platform, hooking you in solely onto this line. And the next steps of what's going to happen is that I'm just going to have you lift up your feet and let gravity do the rest of the work. And so as you are going down the zip line, let's remember to keep those hands on those handlebars. Because what that means is that they actually act just like you would with steering a bike. And so if you were to end up kind of going left or kind of going right, you can use those to make sure that you're staring and going down the line so that way you can see Alex. As you're also going down, it makes it pretty easy to be able to kind of cross your legs, be able to go straight forward. If you feel like maybe you're going a little bit too fast and not quite feeling that, you can kind of open up and starfish out so you slow down. If you want to go a little bit faster and you're kind of looking for that thrill, you can kind of scrunch up like a cannonball so that way you can kind of increase your speed. So I'm going to go ahead and unhook and go down the zip line. Coming, coming, coming. coming. Start to put your brake on. Awesome. Okay, so we're now on platform one of our zip line course. A couple things to be able to talk about here. It's a little bit specifically about where we are. And so it got mentioned earlier that we're in the University Research Forest. And so what does that mean? So like we said, the University Research Forest is just north of Cooper's Rock State Forest. It's about 20 minutes outside of Morgantown. And so what that means for us is that it's about 7,600 acres that the university actually leases from the state each year. And so our university research force acts as a multitude of different resources for our students, faculty, and general public to be able to use. Our course and our entire center itself up here only takes about seven to eight acres. And so up here as well, the forestry department manages the uh, whole area actually. 
So they do a variety of different classes, they do a variety of different burns, they also do logging and different features. In fact, they actually have a sawmill just across the street from our course. And so besides that, there's other departments too. Sometimes you might have the forensics department, you might have uh, photo journalism, or you might actually have ROTC come up here and do a variety of different programming. So it's a really cool resource that is available to the public to be able to come out here, just be able to hike, fish, hunt, or come out on our course and be able to enjoy some of our higher ups activities. And so as we're going through, we hope you enjoy it. If you don't, that's okay. We hope you still get to have that fun experience up at height. So now I'm going to go ahead and go down our first line. It's about 100 to 200 feet long. You can go about 10 miles per hour if you cannonball going into the next platform. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and unhook. Get into here. And we will see you all on the zip side. So, what makes our canopy tour a canopy tour. Basically, if you hadn't noticed, we have these trees growing through the center of our platforms. All of our platforms are built in northern red oaks. We do that on purpose. Northern red oaks sort of have a few features that we appreciate in trees. One, if you notice this one, it grows nice and straight. It's important to have a straight tree because, well, we have platforms in them with people. We want a nice straight base for the tree. Also, if you notice by looking up, there's not a lot of branches on this northern red oak. That's because northern red oaks are self-pruning. What that means is that as they grow, they naturally kill off lower branches. That sort of makes our jobs easier and we don't have to prune these trees. Another sort of the last factor about northern red oaks is that they're a hardwood tree species. We're up on Chestnut Ridge and we get tons of crazy weather, wind, snow, hail storms. So it's important that we have strong trees that are gonna last a long time and can weather the elements. Biodiversity is a phrase that is often thrown around when talking about biology and sort of the outdoors in general. And West Virginia is special because we have an extremely biodiverse tree species and group of species here. Partly because of our unique climate and different uh, elevations in the state and our high precipitation allows us to have over 150 different species of trees living in West Virginia. Now, there are more biodiverse areas in the world first being the Amazon rainforest, where there's over 2,000 different species of trees. But we are actually second, a very distant second, but second nonetheless. All right, so this is our second zip line. It's about 300 feet, and we'll be going about speeds of about 15 or 16 miles per hour. I'll see you guys over there. Okay, so if you look behind me, and you can also see it from platform four, there's actually a, kind of a hill in what is actually referred to as a ridge line. And so specifically that is Chestnut Ridge. And what's significant about that is that is the most westward ridge line in the Appalachian Mountains. And what does that mean? And so that means that theoretically, if you take out air, you take out gravity, and if you made a paper airplane, from Chestnut Ridge right there, you could take it, you could throw it out west, and you would not hit a point as high in elevation until you hit about 10 miles south of Denver, Colorado. And so that's pretty cool. And so what that also means too is due to that elevation increase, and so we can even bring that a little step closer. And so Morgantown, which is about 20 minutes away, is only about 1,000 feet in elevation. When you get up to Chestnut Ridge and even on our hill right here where we have the base of our course, it's about 2,300 feet in elevation. So it's about a 1,300 foot increase. And so being able to combine that elevation increase while also being the most westward ridge line, we get a lot more severe weather. And so what ends up happening is that you have all that weather that develops out in the Great Plains and out west. It comes across, it hits Chestnut Ridge and creates a rain shadow effect. And so we get dramatically more rainfall per, per year than a lot of other places. And so combining that with that elevation increase between Morgantown and Chestnut Ridge here, it's also an average about 5 to 10 degrees cooler. And we also get a lot higher amounts of precipitation. And so especially when we get into the winter time here, if Morgantown gets a dusting of snow, we can get about six to eight inches. That's actually kind of cool for this past uh, winter. We got enough snow where we had at our highest, we had about three feet of snow at one point here. 
And so we actually had to snowshoe to come up here and check out on our course and make sure that there was so much snow that it didn't potentially harm any of our trees or any of our course elements or facilities. So thank you all very much for being part of this experience today. We hope you got to enjoy it. We're going to start our hike back up to our shed and we hope you all get to enjoy the rest of your day. And finally, to wrap up our day, we head over to some of our 4-H friends and learn about proper communication skills. Learning to communicate well is important in building healthy relationships. Communication is about choosing words carefully and paying attention to how we say those words. Hurtful words can include things like bullying and gossip, as well as mean texts, Snapchats, and inappropriate Facebook postings. Words have power. They can build us up or they can tear us down. No matter how hard we try, we cannot completely smooth out the paper. They will never quite be the same. We challenge you to create a happy gram with a helpful and encouraging message for someone in your life. Here's one that I made. Let's talk about it. How do you feel when you receive helpful and encouraging words? How do you feel when you share helpful and encouraging words to others? We can say the same words to different people and in different ways. In what ways can the same words send a different message? When we disagree with someone, we often send a you message. You messages usually come off as put downs. Put downs may lead to more put downs. What happens when you feel blamed, accused, attacked, or attacked with a you statement? Have you heard of I messages? I messages help to share either positive or negative emotions. A good way to send these I messages is when I feel because. For example, when you are on time, I feel I can play better because I'm not so rushed in getting to ball practice. Turning you message like this, you always embarrass me. Into an I message when you tell this jokes, I feel embarrassed because not everybody thinks they're funny. Remember, there's power in our word choice and how we say them. My mom always says to surround yourself with people who build you up, not break you down. Are you a builder? Well, that wraps us up for today. Stay safe. Have fun. Bye-bye.